Okay, here we go. Uh, internal validity. This is the important one. Uh, you know, some researchers feel that it's not as important as other, other types in different fields. Different researchers have different evaluations of how important this is. But in terms of experimental psychology and my field, experimental social psychology, uh, this is the really big one. Uh, so uh, in a way, this is one of the more important video lectures this semester. Uh, again, the definitions I gave you in the earlier uh, lecture, we are looking at internal validity in this one. Only the IV is changing between conditions. That means the experiment is confound free. So, uh, you know, there's the uh, basic and advanced research methods video lecture. Uh, there's the controlling confounds lecture. Uh, you can watch those to, you know, uh, you know, get some background on this. But the idea is that we've gotten rid of all the confounds in our experiment, and so therefore only the IV is changing between conditions. That is, if we have a two-condition experiment, uh, the only thing that's different uh, across the control and experimental conditions would be uh, the level of the independent variable. And so therefore, anything, any difference we see in the dependent variable has to be caused by the IV. And we have basically demonstrated that relationship. That's what an experiment is all about. To ensure good internal validity, a study needs three things. Uh, random assignments to groups uh, or equivalent groups, the control of extraneous variables, nuisance variables, and comparison groups. So let's look at the, these three categories individually. Uh, first off, uh, no, that was wrong. Okay. I can't go back, yeah. Uh, to ensure, three, two, one. To ensure good internal validity, uh, you need random assignment to groups, you know, such as equivalent groups. Uh, you need the control of, you know, nuisance variables, make sure they don't confound. And then you need a comparison group. And as long as you have these three things, you have good internal validity. The minute you lose one of these things, uh, you start to enter a gray area where you may have threats to internal validity. So let's take a look at the three uh, categories of threats to internal validity and describe uh, some of the more commonly found threats within these three categories. Differential treatment of conditions, biasing, and not controlling subject variables. So let's take a look at differential treatment of conditions. Uh, this occurs uh, when you are treating conditions differently. That is, the experimental group is being treated differently than the control group uh, for something other than the independent variable. And what that literally means is that you have a confound. And, of course, this can also happen uh, when you, uh, you know, run experiments without control groups which is why we want to have control groups. Uh, so again, I'm going to go over these. These are in your textbook. Please refer to your text uh, for more background. I'm just kind of organizing things and giving you my take. So first off, history. Uh, history is a non-IV event which affects the dependent variable. And so this is a classic idea of a confound. Uh, something happens to just one condition of the experiment uh, and so, therefore, you have an extraneous variable uh, that's not an IV, and it's correlated or co-varies with the independent variable, and that's the definition of a confound. And so, history is essentially uh, a very specific confound. So, if you have somebody wander into the experimental condition of an experiment and get into the fight with a researcher, which happens more than you would want to know, uh, that would be a confound based on history, a threat to history in terms of internal validity. Uh, another uh, you know, problem with differential treatment is maturation. Maturation means that the subjects grow during the experiment. 
And in a normal experiment, this is not a big issue, but let's say that we're talking about uh, a study that runs over a year. And we have maybe fifth graders. And you can say, well, you know, some very important cognitive changes are occurring to those fifth graders during a whole year. So they may grow during the year. Uh, that's pretty normal. And again, as long as you have a control group, the experiment will recognize that and not allow that to confound. Uh, the problem is when you don't uh, have a control group, for example, if you do a pre and a post test, uh, that is, you have one group of fifth graders, you give them a test at the beginning of fifth grade, and then at the end of fifth grade, you give them another test, uh, this, you know, uh, again, and then you compare the pre and the post test, and you say, hey, these uh, students got better during their fifth grade year, so our new math teaching technique must work. Well, it could be that they just naturally grew. Without a control group, you're unable to recognize that. There are also ways that you can, with a control group, screw up. So you get uh, you know, uh, kids who are maturing faster in one group than another. So you always need to watch out for different rates of maturation. Regression towards the mean, definitely look at the textbook for this one. Uh, this is, uh, sounds very statistical, and it is. Uh, what this essentially says is, in certain situations, when you measure something more than once, uh, the first score, if it's extreme, will get less extreme when you measure it again. That is, when you measure something more than once, if the first score is very extreme, it will naturally get less extreme the second time you measure it. And regression to the mean, again, comes into problems when you have no control group. Uh, for example, I just heard a statistic uh, that in 2014, uh, you know, America had the highest number of police officers killed uh, than the last several years. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, again, I, you know, uh, I was like, well, you know, ugh. <laughs> Regression to the mean is when uh, you measure the same thing twice. And uh, the first time you measure it, you have a very extreme score. And then the second time you measure it, you'll discover that that extreme score will get less extreme. And it has nothing to do with the independent variable. It has nothing to do with the experiment. It's just basically a statistical fluke. That is, uh, an extreme score is unlikely a normal score is more likely. And so you have an unlikely event. What's going to follow it? Another unlikely event or a likely event? A likely event is going to follow it. Uh, so again, uh, regression to the mean is not a problem as long as you have groups that are treated equally and you have a control group. Uh, the problem is when you have differential treatments of groups. For example, one classic regression problem uh, is that you form groups based on a pretest. And so what that means is, I want to see how well watching Sesame Street helps uh, preschool children. So I, I give them the Metropolitan Readiness Test, and I you know, basically split them up. That those that score high, uh, that are ready for kindergarten, they're going to go into the control group because they don't need Sesame Street. Those that score low who aren't ready to go into kindergarten. They're going to go in the experimental group, and we're going to show them an episode of Sesame Street once a day all summer long before kindergarten. And then we measure their scores on the Metropolitan Readiness Test again, and we discover that the control group, who had high scores originally, now have lower scores. So those kids got dumber over the summer. Uh, the experimental group who saw Sesame Street who had extremely low scores to begin with, their scores got higher. So Sesame Street works. And again, it's not that necessarily Sesame Street works, but it's that you created these two groups based on extreme scores. And the scores will naturally get less extreme over time. That's regression to the mean. Another uh, you know, problem is with regression is when you don't uh, have a control group 
and you're just basically looking at year-to-year -year averages. So, for example, uh, you know, this happens all the time. Uh, you look at Regent test scores, and you say that, uh, you know, if a high school is in the lower 5% of its, you know, of the Regent scores for all the high schools, that school is going to be put on academic proba probation, and you're going to, like, get medieval on their buttockses, and, and, uh, you know, you know, do things to enrich the faculty and students and everything else. Uh, and then what happens is that the next year, the Regent scores go up. And so you say, all of these things we did must work. So let's do that for every school. No, because what happens is, if you're in the lower 5% of Regent scores one year, that's an extreme score. So the next year, you're going to have a less extreme score. And so that's regression to the mean. Uh, and then we have testing, uh, which is using the same pre- and post-tests. And then subjects remember questions from the earlier test, and that somehow affects their scores on the second test. So, for example, if we're giving the same uh, academic test this week and then next week, uh, you may run across a, a question on one of the academic tests in the pre-test, like, for example, what is the population of the United States? And you don't know. So you go and you go Google it, and now you know it. And then when that question comes up on the post-test, you know the answer. But it has nothing to do with the experiment you're in. It has something to do with the fact that you saw that question on the pretest. And again, if you're using a uh, you know, control group, you don't really have that problem. Uh, the problem occurs when you're using different tests for the pre and post group or you're just using, a, you know, a, a, or you have different uh, tests for the control and experimental group, or you're using like a pre and post test. And then finally, we have participant problems. Uh, these are problems of the, you know, how the participants are placed in their treatment conditions. Uh, so we could have differential assignment to conditions. What this means is you're not randomly assigning subjects to conditions. Uh, there is some systematic way that you're putting subjects into conditions. Uh, so if you're not using an absolutely textbook, textbook uh, example of random assignment, uh, some type of weird bias could get into your selection process. Uh, it could be uh, something unconscious or something very conscious where uh, you're forming groups to do different programs and the parents of the children who are told they're going to be in the control group complain. And so you move them into the experimental group because they complain. And that would be an example of differential assignment. Uh, you're not following the random procedure or the matching procedure you had. Uh, you're using some other method to switch people around. And uh, finally, there's differential attrition. Attrition is dropping out. So when you have more subjects dropping out of one experimental condition than the other, that changes who's in the experiment. And you could have a confound and a threat to validity based on one group dropping out more than the other group. And in biasing, the category biasing, there's two uh, subcategories, experimenter bias and participant bias. Uh, experimenter bias uh, is when experimenter expectations influence the treatment or perception of students. So with treatment, there's the compliance bias, uh, which is you could focus more on one group of subjects to make sure that they are following the instructions more than the other. And that bias may be conscious or unconscious. You may unconsciously know, well, this is the experimental group, and you know, I really want to make sure they listen and understand, so I go over things twice. I don't do that to control group. Uh, that would be a threat to internal validity. Uh, also, uh, the experimenter can treat the subjects differently uh, and basically cause them to answer or behave in certain ways. We call this the clever Hans effect. Clever Hans with a horse uh, about 125 years ago who could do math, do arithmetic. And it turned out that Hans could not do arithmetic. It's just that uh, his owner would relax his shoulders when Hans gave the right answer and so Hans would stop clopping his hoof uh, 
to give the number answer. And that's how Hans figured out the right answer. And so there's all sorts of ways a researcher could unconsciously or consciously force subjects' behaviors into uh, you know, supporting the hypothesis. With uh, perception, uh, all the social psychology biases uh, come into play here. So you have an attention bias in that uh, the researcher may be paying more attention to the experimental group because that's the important group. They may measure things and count things more carefully in that group than the other group. This may be conscious or unconscious. Then there's also a classification bias where uh, the researcher uh, you know, is paying extra special attention to the uh, experimental group, and so they're applying the definition of what a behavior is or what a behavior isn't very carefully to that group, but they're not being that careful to the control group. Uh, the way that you can control for experiment, experimental bias, experimenter bias, is automating the procedure. That is when a human researcher is not uh, you know, giving the instructions or presenting the materials, then there's no way subconscious bias could come across. So having automatic procedures, a computer program, uh, written instructions, that's one way of doing it. Another is a double blind procedure where not only are the subjects unaware of the condition they're in, but the researcher is unaware of the condition that they're running. And you can do this in ways such as giving the researcher different instructions or keeping the researcher literally unaware about who would be in what instru uh, you know, condition of the experiment. Participant bias. Uh, you know, can be caused by demand characteristics. A demand characteristic is an experimental artifact that is something in the procedure uh, where the participant forms an impression, correct or incorrect, of the experiment's purpose and subconsciously or consciously changes their behavior to fit that interpretation. So, for example, you may hear rumors about the study. You may hear about the study from your ro uh, roommate or from somebody in... Uh, a club that you're in. And these rumors may make you think about, well, what, this, what is this study about? And then you start to think about it, and you say, oh, this study must be about this. So I'm going to start to, uh, you know, when I go to the experiment, I'm going to make sure I do that, because I want to help the experimenter out. Uh, so also there's hints in the laboratory or on the web page. Uh, they could be you know, subconsciously put in there by the researcher. Uh, but still, it's enough to hint to the uh, subject, or the subject thinks it's a hint and makes the wrong assumption. Doesn't matter if they make the wrong assumption, they're going to go with it. And so you're going to get artificial behavior. Uh, explicit or implicit communications with the researcher. Uh, the researcher could uh, unconsciously or very consciously say things that give away the hypothesis of the experiment. And as I said before, most subjects, when they think they figured it out, they want to be a good subject, and so they change their behavior to help the experimenter. Now, if they figured it out incorrectly, that's not going to help the experimenter. But if they figured it out correctly, uh, changing their behavior means that the experimenter is studying artificial behavior, which is not what they wanted. Uh, another thing that can cause participant bias is the knowledge that they're being studied. Uh, one way that can happen is the Hawthorne effect. Uh, that is, knowing that you're being studied by a researcher increases your motivation, and you do better on certain tasks. Or uh, the other side of the coin is evaluation apprehension. That is, knowing that you're being studied by a researcher makes you nervous, and you make mistakes. Uh, so the way that we can control for these participant biases is by using deceptive research. That is, if the subject is not aware of what the, sub, uh, the study is about because they're being deceived, they can't form any type of uh, impression about what that is. Also, field research, where you're doing the experiment in a natural setting and subjects don't know they're in an experiment at all, uh, that can prevent these type of participant biases. Uh, again, uh, doing either one of those types of research 
requires extreme circumstances in terms of ethics review. So you have to have a very important study to be able to get to that level of bending the ethical rules. Another very easy method to do this is use of a manipulation or hypothesis guessing chance, uh, where at the end of the experiment, you sit down with the subject and you ask them, what, what do you think the experiment was about? Uh, you know, tell me, and you just listen to them talk and you record it. And if they kind of guessed what the experiment was about, uh, that might mean you want to throw out their data. If they guessed wrong, you still want to might throw out their data. A lot of subjects in their uh, hypothesis guessing checks say, eh, I don't know, something about gender. You know, and if, depending upon your hypothesis, that might be okay. Uh, but you know, if they say, oh, this was about race, or if they say, oh, this was about, I you know, just studied this in intro psych, it was about you know, this thing or that thing, uh, that's so specific that they could be behaving artificially. So you may want to you know, throw away their data. Uh, manipulation check is just a check to see if they paid attention to the manipulation. And that's usually done in concert with a hypothesis guessing check. Our next category is the appropriate control of subject variables. And by subject variable, all this means is that we want to have equivalent groups. And we want to control subject differences. And there are two ways that we can control for subject differences. One way is uh, the between subjects method. Between subjects is all about creating equivalent groups, that is, groups that are the same on all important characteristics at the beginning of the experiment. Uh, we can do that two ways, by matching or by random assignment. Uh, or there's another way. Uh, you know, matching, it means that we want to get somebody who's like one person in the control group so that, to balance off that person in the experimental group. Well, taking matching to its logical extreme, what if we put the same person in the control group that's in the experimental group? And that's what within subjects is about. Uh, but then when we do within subject experiments, we have order effects, uh, which basically means every time you go through the experiment, uh, something happens to you. You may get a little tired, you may get a little worn out, and that will negatively affect your performance in the next uh, uh, condition. Or you may get to learn something about the experiment, and that may improve your behavior in the next condition. And so we have to counterbalance uh, to take out those uh, order effects. Then there's also carryover effects. Carryover effects is that when one condition is so extreme that it affects the behavior of every condition after that, uh, you know, that's a carryover effect. An example of carryover effect is giving a subject a drug. So if I give you a drug and put you through one condition, you can't just say, okay, the drug no longer works, we're going to go to the next condition. Of course, you, know, the, you can't just say the drug no longer works. It's still in the bloodstream and everything. So that's an example, and a very common example of a carryover effect. That is, uh, you know, getting the subjects, uh, you know, on some type of drug will affect their behavior for a long time to come, and assuming, you know, that it will affect their behavior for every single condition they're in afterwards. So when you have carryover effects, there's nothing you can do but use between subject designs. And that's it for uh, threats to internal validity. Here is Maynard the cat. A uh, cat, lab cat, that was so mellow, they could put a dog mask on him. Uh, and uh, this was a developmental study to see exactly when children develop the ability to recognize that when your external uh, characteristics change, your internal characteristics may stay the same. So they asked the kids, uh, do you think Maynard would bark now or, you know, meow? And they found that, indeed, between the ages of three and six, children were you know, developed in their ability to recognize that internal states don't change when you uh, change external appearances. This is why kids freak, little kids freak out when daddy puts on a Santa mask, because daddy's changed. Okay, have a good day. <laughs>